You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 296, Exodus 25, part one. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Pretty good. Busy. Our our move is really sneaking up on us here, even though we've had we had ten months or whatever it was. We're just close. feeling the pressure. Yeah, and uh, yeah. you say Drina is on her way to look at a house. Hopefully, yeah, she is. At the time of this recording, she is probably still on the plane. So I'm letting her pick the house. I don't need to be there. Uh, of course, I'll need to be there to sign papers and all that stuff. But yep, that's what she's doing. So, Lord willing, she'll come back with something really concrete that's pretty sweet you're only mo- months away mike from being a jacksonville jaguar i know <laughs> <laughs> no i don't think that's gonna happen <laughs> yeah any comments uh yeah uh, are you watching the world series go on you know I, i've watched a little bit of both games so i'm kind of i'm kind of shocked that oh very disappointed you know, out, out of the gate washington yeah at the time or you're disappointed school. Oh, at the time of the, I'm a you know I root for all Texas teams, so Ash. Yeah, be well, I, this I was. Easy. I'm hoping the Astros. Yeah, I, I I like them too, but you know, I I guess if Washington wins, it's not awful because I kind of like to see teams win that haven't won either ever or you know for a hundred years or whatever it is. But you know, but yeah, I'm I'm just kind of surprised at the way it's going. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And did we mention last? show or not what the outcome of our fantasy football between me and you was i don't think we mixed no it. no we didn't no this is the first time yeah and uh i'll, what happened? What I'll happened, let Mike? you mention it no please the the on this is your <laughs> the glory is you yours so yes the the, the pugnacious pugs finally picked up a, a win against trey barely uh, Boy, so it was a it was a a close one though it came down well, to yeah it wasn't like it wasn't like micro points. I mean, so up to ten points. I don't know what was it, like it? Ten, ten points or something yeah, like that. Ten points. It's pretty close, considering yeah. we were. Well, I it. was, I was up by like three points going into Monday night. I had Edelman too, and he did good. But and your running back had three touchdowns that night. It was rough. Yep, Sonny Michelle picked the right guy. So yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Might be the only other win I have this year, but uh, you know that would be a good win. <laughs> Well, Mike, did you do your homework that I assigned everybody, which was to watch Raiders of the Lost Ark? I did not watch Raiders, but but people will see a picture of me um, wearing my my jacket, and maybe even yeah, and maybe even the hat. Uh, well, I'm excited because uh, we're going to get into the face melting scripture part of the Bible, right? <laughs> right. It, which right. part of it? Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Part one, we're going to talk about what what the ark was and its purposes. And I, I know I've got face melting here somewhere in the notes. So, hey, this is yeah, that'll gonna, be today. We're going to be here for a little bit, right? There's going to be like three parts of this. Yeah. Correct? Yep. Yeah, we're going to have three parts in Exodus 25. So today we're going to be, you know, sort of begin the discussion of the tabernacle and the items in it. But you know, specifically, we're going to start with the ark of the covenant. Um, Next episode is going to be the Ark of the Covenant again, and and that episode is going to be the whole question of are there ancient Near Eastern parallels or antecedents to the Ark, you know, other Arks in, in other ancient Near Eastern cultures. And then the third part will be the rest of the furniture. So we've got Ark, Ark, and then the rest of the stuff <laughs> coming up in three parts. Uh, we're not going to talk either today or any of those other episodes about what happened to the Ark. Okay, we're not going to do that at all. And the reason is we already did that. We've already done that on the podcast. That's an earlier episode, episode 158, for people who want to hear that sort of thing, you know, theories as to what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. Was it destroyed or not? And where is it? All that sort of stuff. So we're not going to repeat that here. That is episode 158. So let's jump into Exodus 25 here. And really, I'm going to read the first nine verses, because there are a few things to say here before we actually get to the ark in verse 10. 
uh, the ark stuff is verses 10 through 22. So let's just read Exodus 25, 1 through 9. And then I want to say a few things before we actually get into the Ark of the Covenant. So the Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And this is the contribution you shall receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamp, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for setting, for the ephod and for the breastpiece. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so shall you make it. So that's the first nine verses of Exodus 25. It's kind of odd that it mentions the ephod and the breastpiece because the reader wouldn't know what those are because they're not made yet. That's going to be afterwards. But again, you get one of one of these little sort of anachronistic kind of things going on, and we've encountered this in, in the book of Exodus a number of places. But other than that, there are a few things I want to just note real briefly. Take for me, again, that, that wording, it's very clear from Exodus 25 that the materials that are being gathered are for holy use. God's the speaker, and he says, this is for me, this stuff is for me. Uh, ref- the, the things are referred to as a contribution. The Hebrew word his, here is teruma, which is elsewhere translated and basically generally means gift. So it's something given, and of course, if it's a gift, you're not expecting to take it back. It's not a loan, it's a gift. So these are things that uh, are for, for the Lord. They're given you know, freely by the people, and again, with no expectation that they're ever going to be using these things again. They are for the Lord. You know, Sarna combines those two thoughts uh, that I just mentioned this way. He says that teruma is a technical term referring specifically to that which is set aside by its owner and dedicated for sacred use. And that certainly fits the context here. We had a reference to gold, silver, and bronze. Sarna notes in his commentary that the metals are listed in descending order of value. This, in turn, he says, determines their use for various objects. The closer the object is to the Holy of Holies, the more valuable the metal of which it is made. Again, that's intentional. Sarna adds, iron is notably absent from the list, either on account of its great rarity at this time, or because its utilization for more efficient weapons of death made it incompatible with the spiritual ends that the sanctuary was intended to serve. I thought that was an interesting observation, because, again, we had this in Leviticus on a number of occasions where the presence of God is associated with life and not death. And so Sarna is suggesting, hey, maybe the exclusion of iron, since that's going to be a, a warfare you know, metal, Maybe that's why it's excluded, because it's associated with death implements. Possible, we don't know for sure, but you know, it's a coherent possibility. There's another reference in verse 4 to blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, goat skins, and acacia wood. I want to read another excerpt from Sarna here. He says, these are the most expensive dyed yarns of antiquity. The sequence once again reflects their relative value and thus the degree of sanctity that attaches to the objects in which they are used, starting with the Holy of Holies. The dyes were all obtained from animal sources, and the yarns were to be used for the tabernacle hangings and coverings and for the priestly vestments. In the Bible, Hebrew teklet is frequently paired with the Hebrew argaman, purple both being dyes produced from the murex, a marine snail termed chilazon in rabbinic tradition. This creature exudes a yellow fluid that becomes a dye in the red-purple range when exposed to sunlight. So again, this is how it's made. The desired shade was obtained by varying the species of murex and by adding other ingredients. Teklet was probably closer to a violet tint, while argamon had a more reddish hue. So there's your blue and purple and scarlet, uh, or at least blue and purple. The Phoenician coast was famous for its dyeing industry. Immense quantities of marine snail shells dating to the 15th century BC have been found at Ugarit. Modern attempts to reconstruct the process have shown that it required thousands of snails to produce sufficient dye for just one robe. 
This, together with the intensity of the labor and the superiority of the dye's richness and stability, made the products very costly. Hence, possession of Tekelet dyed or Argamon dyed fabrics were marks of wealth, nobility, and royalty. Then Sarna comments on the word crimson or scarlet in the ESV. The Hebrew here is tola'at shani. The first word means a worm, believe it or not. And the second signifies the color. The combination designates the brilliant red dye, this is Sarna now, produced from the eggs of scale insects of the Coxidae family that feed on oak trees. You can add that to your Bible trivia now. Fine linen, lastly, is the Hebrew word shesh. It's a very early term borrowed from Egyptian. Same consonants, shes, used for cloth of exceptional quality. Now, I wanted to include this comment about Egyptian uh, being one of the terms here, uh, this term for fine linen. We're going to see other Egyptian terms in this chapter, and they are going to contribute to next week's episode about the a possible antecedent or, again, parallel object. It's going to be from ancient Egypt. That's the most coherent parallel. So there are Egyptian things, Egyptianisms, in this chapter. And, of course, the context, this is Moses and the Exodus, okay? That shouldn't be a surprise. But I just want to put that on the radar for right now, and we're going to you know, be dealing with it more specifically next time. Now, the ESV goat skins is kind of interesting. The Jewish publication society Tanakh, English translation, believe it or not, renders the Hebrew here as dolphins skins. Dolphins. Well, why does it do that? Well, the Hebrew term is tekashim, and Sarna writes that with one exception, this term always refers to the coverings of the tabernacle. Its exact meaning is uncertain, but in rabbinic times, the tekash, that's the singular form, was invested with mythical association and identified with the unicorn. Because of the similarity with Arabic tukas, remember the Hebrew is takash, Arabic tukas or dukush, which denote both the dolphin and the dugong. Think of a manatee, that might be a more familiar term for you. Those terms in Arabic are denote both the dolphin and the dugong found in the Red Sea. Because of that association, modern scholars have variously identified the biblical creature from these skins, from where they, you know, where they, from whence they come. They've identified this biblical creature either with a dolphin or a dugong, a manatee. A suggestion to equate the term with Akkadian dushu, the name of a precious stone of either yellow or orange color, Sarna writes, seems more plausible. So Sarna is not going to go down the dolphin road and the dugong road, even though other scholars do. He says, this seems more plausible since that word is also used to describe leather that is dyed and tanned the color of the stone. Significantly, only the hides of goats and sheep were so treated. That's the end of Sarna's comment there. So this term, again, might be this, you know, this uh, what the ESV has as goat skins. Uh, might actually be dolphin skins or dugong skins. It's possible, again, but you have to you have to sort of take the Hebrew term and then make Arabic its cognate here. And so you, know, you can find these species in the Red Sea, so maybe that's what we're talking about. But Sarna opts for this this a term that's used of a particular stone that's that's used to color leather, and he thinks that's more plausible. It, it you know it probably is, but just wanted to point out the other possibilities. Acacia wood, let's mention that. Uh, Sarna notes, other than in Isaiah 41, 19, Hebrew shittim always refers to the timbers used in the construction of the tabernacle and its appurtenances. Now, this is significant because, again, shita might also be an Egyptian loan word. So we've got an Egyptian loan word for the linen. We've got an Egyptian loan word for the acacia wood. Again, you're, these these little things are going to accumulate and provide some context for what we'll be talking about next time specifically. Now, in verse 8, God says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. And just a real brief note uh, from Sarna here. He says, careful analysis of the language used here is essential for a proper understanding of the underlying concept and role of the sanctuary. First, the text speaks of God dwelling, not 
in it, not in the sanctuary, but among them, that is, among the people of Israel. That's verse 2. The verb to dwell is not the common Hebrew term yeshav, that's to sit or to dwell. If you've had Hebrew vocabulary, you, you would know that. But it's actually the rarer verb shakan, which has a different connotation. This verb conveys the idea of temporary lodging in a tent and characterizes the nomadic style of life. That is why the structure is called a mishkan, it's from the verb shakan. Mishkan is tabernacle. And why the verbal form is frequently used together with ohel, the common word for tent, and in connection with nomads and nomadic life. The noun mishkan is often employed in synonymous parallelism with ohel, and the other designations of the wilderness tabernacle are the tent of the pact. The tabernacle actually gets called a tent, the tent of the pact, and the tent of meeting. Thus, the sanctuary is not meant to be understood literally as God's abode, as are other institutions in the pagan world. Rather, it functions to make perceptible and tangible the conception of God's imminence, his nearness, that is, of the indwelling of the divine presence in the camp of Israel to which the people may orient their hearts and minds. A post-biblical extension of this usage of the verb shakan is the Hebrew term shekinah. A lot of people say shekinah but it's Shekinah, for the divine presence. That's the end of the, the Sarna excerpt there. So his point here is that the terminology points to the temporary nature of God's presence in, in or with this tent, you know, again, among the people. Now, that's going to become more permanent, obviously, when we get a temple, because a temple is a permanent structure, but a tabernacle isn't. So again, Sarna sort of uses that as a trajectory for understanding a little bit more about uh, how the tabernacle would have been thought of or conceived. Verse 9 says, Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so you shall make it. Now, next time we're going to spend a few minutes focusing on that verse and also verse 40, which essentially says the same thing. God gives Moses a pattern, a tavnit is the Hebrew word for these things, for the tabernacle, for the furnishings. And so, again, just to plant the question in your mind for next time, if God gave Moses a design, is it theologically troublesome if there's a, an ancient Near Eastern parallel to either the tabernacle or like the ark or some other item of furniture in the tabernacle? Is that problematic? Well, again, next time, tune in. For now, we're, we're just going to get into the furniture, specifically the ark for the rest of the episode. So what was the ark? Again, I'm going to read Exodus 25, 10 through 22 just so that we, again, are familiar with what the text actually says here. Beginning in verse 10, God says to Moses, They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold, inside and outside shall you overlay it, and you shall make on it a molding of gold around it. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them on its four feet, two rings on the one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Now, again, we're, we know the ark's made of acacia wood. Now, that, again, that's an Egyptian term. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the, the testimony that I shall give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold. Of hammered work shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on the one end, one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be, and you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. That's the end of the ark section, so that's the end of our selection for today. So. What is this thing? I mean, parts of the description are, are kind of clear. Uh, we should note right away, this, this is verses 10 through 22 of Exodus 25. 
Verses 10 through 16 are about the ark, and verses 17 through 22 are about the lid. Okay, and I know ESV has mercy seat, which is a bit misleading, and we'll get to that in a moment. But the section is actually divided neatly into two subsections, the ark and then the lid. So I want to read a little bit of something from the Dictionary of the Old Testament, uh, the Pentateuch volume. This is by Dick Averbeck uh, at uh, Trinity. And uh, uh, Dr. Averbeck spends a lot of time in, in Leviticus in this sort of uh, literature. I know him. He's a good guy. Um, he's had a long career as a scholar, and this is sort of his sweet spot. But he writes this, The ark was the most important piece of furniture in the tabernacle. It was placed in the inner sanctum of the tent called the Most Holy Place. The cover on the top of the ark was called the atonement seat, the kaporet, from the verb kiper, to make atonement. It was overshadowed by two gold cherubim. According to Leviticus 16.2, the Lord said to Moses, I will appear in the cloud over the atonement seat. So he was to make clear to Aaron and the high priest he was to make clear to them that they must not enter there, enter the Holy of Holies, except once a year on the Day of Atonement. With regard to Moses, however, the Lord would meet with Moses there and speak to him all the commandments so that he could deliver them to the Israelites. In fact, the ark was the depository of the two stone tablets of the law, which the Lord was about to give Moses on the mountain. Thus, the ark is sometimes called the ark of the testimony or the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Let's just stop there. I mean, those are actually related because the testimony being referred to are, you know, the tablets, which we've spent uh, enough time already talking about. And the tablets were sort of at the core of the covenant that God is making, you know, with the people of Israel. So that's why the Ark is called what it is. These tablets, the testimony, the edut in Hebrew, they are stored inside the Ark, and so the Ark becomes known as the Ark of the Testimony or the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Back to Averbeck. The Ark itself was a rectangular box made of acacia wood overlaid inside and out with pure gold plating. It was roughly two and a half cubits long, circa three feet nine inches, so a little less than four feet, one and a half cubits wide, that's two feet three inches, and one and a half cubits high. There are many species of acacia, Averbeck says, most of which are thorny bushes or shrubs, but a few have trunks from which timber could be cut. It is a very hard and durable wood that is also lightweight. The term acacia, shatim, is of Egyptian origin. Gold molding ran along its edges and two gold rings were attached to each long side so that the acacia wood poles overlaid with gold could be inserted along both sides for carrying the ark without touching it. The poles were to remain in the rings permanently. So the ark, again, look at the description we have. We've got another Egyptian term because it's made of this particular kind of wood. And again, that's going to be an item for next week because we're going to see there's, there's lots of other Egyptian things that are sort of like the Ark. Now, and, and I won't even say sort of, but, but quite a bit like the Ark. But we'll save that for next time. We're going to be exploring at, at that point an article here that I'm going, to, I'm going to just refer to here because there's something in the article I want to cite in this episode. But uh, an article by Scott Nogel, it's N-O-E-G-E-L, and I believe this might be online. It's the Egyptian origin of the Ark of the Covenant. So right away, it tells you where he's coming from uh, in, in a book called Israel's Exodus in Transdisciplinary Perspective. It's 20, 2015. So Nogel, again, basically goes through the dimensions of the Ark, like we just read with Averbeck and so on and so forth. And he, he talks about the contents of the Ark. Now listen to this. He says the, the, the contents of the ark were the tablets of the law, and he references Deuteronomy 10, 1 through 5, and Exodus 25, 22, a jar of manna, Exodus 16, 33 and 34, and possibly the rod of Aaron, number 17, 10. Now, the reason why he's cautious there, we'll get to in a moment, because there's something kind of odd here uh, going on. I mean, Nogal is cautious because, I'll just telegraph it now, because Josephus, when Josephus is writing about the Ark, he actually says that the Ark was empty. That's in Jewish Wars, Book 5, uh, 219, Paragraph 219. But there's actually a—I mean, that's Josephus. You know, Josephus can more or less say what he wants, but there's actually a biblical passage that appears very clearly contradictory to what Nogal has just referenced. Let me just go back to it. So you've probably been taught that there were three things in the ark. Okay, you got the tablets, that's the easy one. That's very obvious. 
jar of manna. That's Exodus 16, 33, and 34, and then number 17, 10 for the rod of Aaron. You probably have been taught that just any number of times, okay? But there's a problem because, let me just read you, 1 Kings 8, 9. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. Bet you don't remember 1 Kings 8, 9. <laughs> you probably remember, again, things you, you've been taught about the ark. But, you know, what, what's going on there? We'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But just, just again, store that away because there, there are actually a lot of things to discuss here. Now, going back to Nogal a little bit, he also lists or, or discusses what he views as kind of the, what the ark did or what, what the purpose was. He says, in addition to serving as a reliquary, in other words, a, a place that you, you put stuff in, okay, texts attribute two other functions to the ark. Most prominently, it served as the symbolic presence of Yahweh. In times of war, Yahweh led as the Lord of hosts, seated upon the cherubim, surrounded by standard bearers preceding him. Each standard was topped with a banner representing an Israelite tribe or family line. This, this, this the description comes from Numbers 2, 1 through 34, Numbers 10, 35, and Psalm 132, 8. As the symbolic presence of Yahweh, the ark was connected to miracles and oracles. Thus, when the priests carried the ark into the Jordan River, the waters parted. It's Joshua 3, 8 through 17. And Moses, Phinehas, Samuel, Saul, and David each received divine direction from the ark. Exodus 25, 22, Exodus 36, Numbers 7, 89. Judges 20, 27, and 28, 1 Samuel 3, 3, 1 Samuel 14, 18, so on and so forth. So, you know, the ark, if, if we were, could actually sort of summarize this, you know, like what was the ark and, and, and what did it do? In a nutshell, the ark is a box made of wood. It's plated with gold. It has a solid gold lid. The wood that it's made of is acacia wood, shatim in Hebrew, a term that you know, it's quite possibly of Egyptian origin. Second, the ark and its lid were associated with God's presence. Again, mercy seat is a bit misleading because the ark is elsewhere going to be described as the footstool of God. Uh, the, the term actually kaporet doesn't mean mercy seat. You know, the, there's no inherent uh, mercy meaning in kaporet or even the verb kipare to atone. Well, again, we'll come back to that thought as well. Third. God dispensed information to Moses when meeting with him at or upon the ark. Okay, so the point is the ark had some sort of oracular function. It, 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 was, it was not a conduit for divine revelation, but it was associated with an, an appearance of God in, in the cloud when God dispensed divine information. Okay, it wasn't like a radio or something like that or a transmitter. This is internet theology now. It was the place where God would meet Moses or you know, some of these other individuals and dispense information, revelation. Fourth, because God was present with or upon the ark, it at times was present to lead Israel in battle. Now, there's no evidence at all in the Bible that the ark was some kind of weapon. Okay, this is Hollywood. This is Raiders of the Lost Ark. The ark doesn't shoot death rays. Okay, there's no passage like that. It's not a weapon, but it was, again, brought out into battle or onto the battlefield. Why? Because the presence of God was associated with it. Fifth, as God's throne, the lid of the ark was accompanied by cherubim or cherubim, which are stylized throne guardians, divine throne guardians. Again, if you've read Unseen Realm or heard me lecture on uh, cherubim and different terms for the heavenly hosts, that should be old information. But uh, uh, this was a throne guardian, a, a, a supernatural creature, a supernatural entity that protected sacred space from defilement. That's what a, a cherub was. Six, the ark, and I think this is important too, the ark did not contain God. In other words, God didn't live in the ark. This is contra Graham Hancock and a whole bunch of other people. Rather, the ark contained the tablets, at least, for, according to 1 Kings 8 9, that's all that, that it contained. But then you have these other verses about the pot of manna and the rod of Aaron. We'll come back to that in a second. Now, Sarna writes this. He says, God is never said in the Hebrew Bible, 
He is never said to reside in the ark or to speak from it as though he were inside. It only says that he communicates with Moses from above it. That's verse 22, Exodus 25, 22. There I will meet with you and, you know, from above the mercy seat, between the two cherubim that are on the Ark of the Testimony, okay? God is never said to reside in it or to speak out of it, from it. It is therefore likely that the Ark represented the footstool of God's throne, which was imagined to be situated above it. In fact, it is metaphorically so described as the footstool in 1 Chronicles 28, 2 which says, Then King David rose to his feet and said, Hear me, my brothers and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God. And I made preparations for building. Now, aside from all that, the main purpose of the Ark was, of course, the place of God's presence and its role in the Day of Atonement. Again, the lid is the kaporet. That's the noun form of the verb kiper, which is typically translated to atone or to make atonement. I think to, to, to wrap our heads around the Ark and the Day of Atonement, we need to talk about the mistranslation of mercy seat. Let, let's just get into that. So Sarna writes this about the caporet, the lid. Again, and many translations have mercy seat. He writes, a solid slab of pure gold is to be placed above the Ark. This is, the, again, the lid. Solid slab which was open at the top. The dimensions of the slab correspond exactly to those of the ark. This object is called in Hebrew kaporet, a word that has traditionally been rendered mercy seat in the English versions. This is based on the Septuagint and Vulgate translations, both of which mean, quote, an instrument of propitiation, unquote, and follow the usual sense of the Hebrew stem kpr, okay, the kaf, pe, resh, kiper, to atone or make expiation. This understanding would appear to be strengthened by the instruction in Leviticus 16, 15 and 16, that at this spot in the Holy of Holies, the high priest is to perform expiatory rites on the Day of Atonement. Nevertheless, mercy seat is not a satisfactory translation of kaporet, since the aspect of mercy is an interpretation and is not inherent in in the word itself. Now, back in our series on Leviticus, okay, I quoted when we were doing, uh, again, the episodes there, specifically it's episode 66, if you wanted to go back and listen to all that. I quoted this same section from Sarna to make the point that the Hebrew term translated mercy seat, kaporet, simply means lid. That's what it is. You have to sort of understand what's happening and not happening with compared, you know, to make atonement. Again, you could go back and listen to the whole episode, but I'm going to try to summarize it here, or at least you know maybe quote part of it based on the transcript uh, from episode 66. But atonement, to atone, this verb is not about satisfying a deity, appeasing a deity. It's about purgation. It's to purge. I used, I used the, the, the phrase in, in the episode a lot, to de- decontaminate. Because if you go back and read Leviticus 16, the blood that gets you know, sprinkled there in the Holy of Holies, and the, you know, the, the, the sanctuary there, the inner sanctum, and on the kaporet, on the lid, the blood is never applied to people, ever. No, at no part of the Day of Atonement is the blood ever applied to any person. What it was about was about purging the ark and the, again, inner sanctum there, Wherever the blood touched, it was about purging it from defilement. And since you did this once a year, you were essentially hitting the reset button. You were restoring the sanctuary, the most holy objects and the most holy places, to their original use. Like, like you, again, you hit the reset button, everything goes back to where it was when the priesthood and the sacrificial system essentially began. Think of it as a reset button. So I I wrote this, or I said this in the the episode. The lid, again, and the ritual, more importantly, the Day of Atonement, ensures decontamination. It's like creating a clean room for those of you in engineering or maybe that work in computers. That's the idea. You just cleanse and decontaminate. You protect. You insulate the specific area, in this case, sacred space, from some person bringing the offering 
and that includes even the, the high priest, you know, a person entering sacred space. The system, again, was designed to purge sacred space from defilement. You know, when it gets to the innermost sanctuary where only the high priest is allowed in, again, the Day of Atonement, it still has the same purpose. It still has that purpose. The term kipper comes from the Akkadian kupuru, which means to wipe off or to wipe clean, to cleanse. It refers to the act of cleansing or wiping away impurity, wiping away contamination. So that is the purpose of the Day of Atonement. You can summarize Leviticus 16 that way. Leviticus 16 is essentially hitting the reset button, where everything associated with the sacrificial system and the sacred space of Yahweh is reset to the original conditions. You do that once a year. It, it takes the sanctuary, the holy instruments, the vessels associated with service in the sanctuary, the holy place, and even the people, and restores it as though it were all made new again. That's the purpose of the ritual. So it, again, it's not about individual forgiveness of sins or anything like that. It's not about obtaining mercy. Okay, that's why the, that's why the term mercy seat is not a good translation for the lid of the ark. Again, that's all it is. It's just the lid. Kaporet is the the lid. Okay, the the the, the, the uh, if you want to say the atoning lid or something like that, because this is the place where the blood on that day would get sprinkled, only time of year, and again you hit the reset button. It restores everything to its pristine original state. That was the the rationale for what's going on. So before we end, I mean, that's essentially what the Ark is. It's essentially what the Ark does, that, that list that I gave you. Again, to go through it real rapidly, it's a box with a solid gold lid. The box is, is plated with gold. It's made from acacia wood. It's associated with God's presence. God appears above the lid, again, to speak with Moses, so it has an oracular function. Again, it's not a radio, it's not an it's not a machine, it's not, there's no dials on it or you know, something like that. Again, this is, again, internet theology. God is never said to be in the box. He's never said to be in the ark. He is never said to speak out of or from the ark. He appears above the lid, okay, above the, the wings of the cherubim that are affixed to the lid. So the ark doesn't contain God. Now, back to the idea of containment. Since I mentioned this, I want to unpack this a little bit. You know, 1 Kings 8, 9, you know, do we have a contradiction here? So we'll end the episode with this. Again, we've been taught, I mean, I was taught this, that the Ark contains three things, the tablets, the pot of manna, and the rod of Aaron. Now, we know for sure that it has the tablets in it because it, it just says that point blank in a number of places. Here in Exodus 25, we had a reference in Deuteronomy I cited a few minutes ago. And we actually have alluded to this idea already before when it came to the giving of the law, because it was typical in the ancient Near East to, when a king made a covenant with another country, you would take a copy of the covenant and you would put it, again, under the, the throne, or there, there'd, be, there'd be some repository, repository place under the throne. Uh, as if to, again, remind everyone of, of the covenant agreement. So I'm going to read a little bit from Sarna here. He writes this. The sole function of the ark is to house the tablets of stone. Okay, that, that's, I would say it's its major function, but it, it still is the place, again, where this, the reset button is hit. According to the testimony of 1 Kings 8-9 in the Solomonic Temple, there was nothing inside the ark but the two tablets of stone that Moses placed there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites after their departure from the land of Egypt. The practice of depositing legal documents in a sacred place was quite widespread in the ancient Near East. It symbolically underscored the importance of the document and projected the idea that the presiding deity witnessed and guarded it and oversaw its implementation. The, this, the disposition of such legal instruments in this manner is exemplified by, among others, the Treaty of Non-Aggression and Mutual Assistance contracted between King Matuwaza of Mitanni in Upper Mesopotamia, and the Hittite monarch Supi, I always get this wrong, Supi Luliumas. Thus, when Moses deposits the ark, the tablets of stone, okay, in the ark, the tablets of stone, that contain the fundamentals of the covenant between God and Israel, he's following an ancient 
and widespread Near Eastern legal tradition. We talk, we reference this. What about why are there two tablets, two copies? You know all this kind of stuff. So we've had this before, but that begs the question: Why the wording of First Kings eight nine, when it says this is all that was in the ark? The covenant is all that was in the ark. It's the ark of the covenant. It's not the ark of the manna. It's not the ark of Aaron's rod. It's the ark of the covenant. Okay, look at Numbers seventeen ten and Exodus sixteen thirty three. Just listen carefully as I read this. Number 17.10, the Lord said to Moses, put back the staff of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign for the rebels, that you may make an end of their grumblings against me, lest they die. What does the text say? The staff of Aaron isn't said to be put in the ark. It's before the ark, like, like in its presence somewhere in the room. Exodus 16.33, Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. It's never said to be put in it. It's before the Lord. So there's no contradiction with 1 Kings 8.9. 1 Kings 8.9 is quite clear. That's the only thing that was in it, the, the, the tablets. Now you have to ask yourself, well, what about Hebrews 9.4 in the New Testament? Let me read you that. Behind the second curtain was this, a second section called the Most Holy Place. This is a description of the tabernacle. Having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Now Hebrews 9.4 very clearly has the stuff in, but 1 Kings 8.9 denies that. And the Old Testament verses about the jar of manna and Aaron's rod certainly don't require in fact, they don't even say that it was put in. So what do we do with Hebrews 9, 4? Well, in the phrase, again, we're going to have a little a little grammar spasm here. The phrase in Hebrews 9, 4, in which was a golden urn, so on and so forth, in which. It's the Greek preposition en, which can, of course, be translated in as in location. Okay, the, the locative semantic, the locative sense of the preposition in or en in Greek. So, is there any other way that this preposition can be translated? Well, lo and behold, there is. If you've had Greek before, this is going to be a, a, a familiar book, Dan Wallace's uh, book on Greek syntax. It's actually Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics and Exegetical Syntax of the New Testament. He lists 10 semantic possibilities for the Greek preposition N in the dative, which is what we have here in Hebrews 9.4. Spatial temporal, like having to do with time, association, you know, cause, instrumental, reference, respect, manner. I mean, there's a whole bunch of ways that you would translate in or the way you would understand the Greek preposition n. I think the, the one that, that is most important here is just the simple association. So the Greek writer can use this preposition to create an association between two things or more than two things. And so if we take that back to Hebrews 9.4, Having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, okay, which was, again, associated with a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded. Well, it sure was, because those objects were said to be placed before in the presence of the Ark. So again, you, you don't have to see a contradiction here in Hebrews 9, 4 either. You just have to be thinking about the semantic possibilities for this little preposition. So with that, we're going to wrap up our episode. Again, this was a simple introduction to the Ark. You know, we found out what the Ark was, what it did, but we've dropped some breadcrumbs all along the way here to get us to think about, okay, here we have this object, this box. We know what it's for. You know, God meets with Moses on, you know, above it. He gets information, so it's, it's an oracle of some, some kind. It's intimately associated with the Day of Atonement ritual. It holds you know, the tablets of the covenant. You know, it, it might be taken out to the battlefield because the presence of God was associated with it. Again, it's not a weapon. It's not a radio. It's not a transmitter. Again, all this stuff. stuff. The text never affirms these ideas. So we've covered today what the text does affirm. And the next time we're going to talk about, okay, is this like anything else that Moses would have seen or known especially? Is there an, a, a parallel antecedent to the Ark in ancient Near Eastern religion or civilization? 
So we'll talk about that next time because basically the answer is, yeah, there is. There is. And so we have to be able to think well about that, especially when Exodus 25, verse 9 and verse 40 had God giving Moses the template, the pattern for it. Okay, Mike, but uh, you left out the laser beam shooting out of it uh, clearly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have a verse for that. I'm, I have a Hollywood script for that. I don't are, have a verse for it. For some reason, I'm, be, I'm getting let down here, Mike. It's, uh, but that's okay. It's uh, kind of lame, right? I know. Yeah, no, yeah. It's all right. All right, well, we'll be looking forward to part two uh, next time. And uh, we're going to have three parts on this, correct? Yep. Okay, good. All right, we'll be looking forward to that. All right, Mike. Thanks. We'll let everybody go with that. I just want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bubble Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.